Corrosion Part 6. Hello everyone, this is Corrosion Audio Lecture 6 on localized corrosion phenomena. In the notes, this lecture corresponds to Chapter 4 at the start of the second handout. The second handout is all about real-world corrosion and real-world corrosion protection. So it's a descriptive handout in contrast to the first handout, which was mainly about idealized electrochemical models for corrosion. Now, so far, using the stuff from the first handout, we can use simple algebra to calculate a corrosion current density, and hence to predict a speed of corrosion in millimeters per year for some idealized situation. Now, very commonly, in the real world, uh, it turns out that corrosion is worse than we might expect if we only knew about idealized electrochemical models. In which case, like Valentin Zukovsky in The World Is Not Enough, we might end up with the unpleasant thought that probably we should have bought more insurance. That's a thought which we never want to have about something which we have designed, and therefore we need to learn about all of the localized corrosion phenomena which, if we can expect them, we won't come across something unanticipated. What the 9 or 10 localized corrosion phenomena in Chapter 4 have in common, and there's a few more in uh, textbooks like Fontana, is that localized corrosion phenomena are relatively hard to predict, difficult to see or detect, and often relatively fast. Uh, th these are uh, ways in which they are worse relative to uniform corrosion, which is what you have when there isn't localized corrosion phenomena, in which case the electrochemical models, the idealized electrochemical models, which just predict a single number, a speed of corrosion in millimeters per year, Uniform corrosion is when that single number is enough to correctly describe corrosion taking place over the entire surface of some object. So if we look at a picture of uniform corrosion, uh, we might see these uh, steel pipes which have been left out in a yard, and everywhere over the surface they have a, a uniformly thick layer of oxidation. So this looks ugly, but this generalized corrosion or uniform corrosion is in many ways the best possible case that we can have, or it is if active corrosion is happening, because if we have it, the corrosion happening uniformly, at least that means that it's easy to see and we can measure the speed of this corrosion anywhere and know that even when we're worried about a piece of metal we can't see, the uniform speed of corrosion there is the same. The speed that we measure is also likely to be pretty slow because all of the oxidizing action is equally distributed over a large metal surface. So unlike in the case of the small zinc anode we looked at at the end of the last handout for bimetallic corrosion and the area effect, uh, we don't have a very concentrated metal a corrosion anode, and therefore we don't have catastrophically fast speeds of corrosion in general. Uh, we have slow or moderately fast corrosion everywhere if, if there's this uniform process. So it looks horrible, uh, but it's actually not so bad. Uh, what is potentially worse is if we turn to section 4.2, we can talk a bit about bimetallic corrosion, also known as galvanic corrosion. When two different metals are connected together, very commonly you have bimetallic corrosion, in which the more reactive metal corrodes much faster than it would have in isolation. The key explanation is that the less reactive metal, the other one, simply provides an additional amount of cathode reaction, but the more reactive metal suffers almost all of the anode oxidation reaction. In particular, bimetallic corrosion can be a particular problem for the more reactive metal if second more noble metal has a high exchange current density. For example, platinum has a high exchange current density for the proton reaction, so if you connect some platinum metal to a similar area of already dissolving iron, then the iron will dissolve faster.
Uh, another thing is that the more noble metal might support additional cathode reactions. Uh, for example, electroplating. A piece of copper metal in a copper sulfate solution can have quite a, a large amount of copper plating cathode reaction happening on it, and this could provide extra cathode reaction which will drive faster anodic dissolution of some other metal connected to the copper, for example, a piece of aluminium. Uh, alternatively, a third thing is that if the more noble metal is clean, then it can provide an, a very effective cathode reaction uh, because it might have no barrier to mass transport. Therefore, it might have, if you have corrosion driven by dissolved oxygen, you might have lots of oxygen able to reach the clean noble metal surface, and that oxygen which reacts will be balanced out by the more reactive metal which was dissolving. Now, on its own, the more reactive metal might have been covered by dirt or corrosion products, and so it might have had a very slow supply of dissolved oxygen, leading to quite slow active corrosion. Uh, but once it's connected to a piece of clean, more noble metal, then the driving force for corrosion, which is quite large, uh, might be able to uh, drive much faster corrosion than the previous mass transport problem would have uh, allowed. So let's look at an example of mathematically how do we deal with bimetallic corrosion questions. So uh, we might have this situation. Consider a strip of iron with zinc metal coated on one side, and this is dissolving in acid. We know already from conservation of charge that the sum of the anode currents is equal to the sum of the cathode currents, equation 4.1. Now we can expand this to equation 4.2, where we consider the possible anode reactions, zinc dissolving and iron dissolving. And we consider those current densities taking place over the area of the relevant piece of metal. And we say the absolute value of these anode currents is equal to the absolute value of the possible cathode currents, which might be hydrogen being produced on zinc, and certainly will be some hydrogen being produced on the iron. Now, what do we do once we have this nonlinear equation 4.2? Well, uh, one thing we can do is that we can idealize and we can simplify. And we can say, let's consider that only two of these reactions, one anode and one cathode, are actually significant. So the others are all negligible processes. Um, in that case, we might end up doing some solution method like this Evans diagram. Uh, we have the dashed blue and pink lines for hydrogen evolution on zinc and iron, respectively. Uh, we have the dashed green line for iron dissolving, and we have the solid black line for zinc dissolving. We already know that if we were trying to solve for zinc dissolving on its own, uh, then we would look for the intersection of the zinc anode with the hydrogen evolution on zinc metal, and we'd find the corrosion potential where this takes place and the corrosion current density for zinc only. We could do the same thing for iron only, considering its reactions. And if we do this assumption of bimetallic corrosion where only the zinc dissolution and only the hydrogen evolution on iron take place at significant current densities, then we can find a third possible solution. We can find this circled red position where we have a bimetallic corrosion current density, and we can read off the corrosion current density for zinc dissolving or equivalently for hydrogen being produced under this situation, and then we can go back and check, and we can say that, yes, indeed, the other reactions were quite negligible. They were two or three orders of magnitude smaller than the ones which we said were significant, so it's okay to neglect hydrogen evolution on zinc and iron dissolution at this bimetallic corrosion potential. So we could do this simplification, and then we could, at the end, go back and check that the simplification was acceptable, and we had found the two significant reactions. Um, but in, And in principle, we might do this in an exam question, for example. We probably would do it that way. But you might say it's the 21st century, and we really ought to do a bit better. Fortunately, we can do quite a lot better, because equation 4.2 is simply a non-linear equation in which four terms add up to zero.
and each of those terms is simply uh, a current density, so it's either given by the Tafel equation, or in fact we can use the full butler volmer equation from, Iqu from chapter 3. If we're dealing with it computationally, the butler volmer equation is tractable enough to work with. And we can write a computer program, and we'll say that we know that we have some system and we can place upper and lower bounds on its surface potential. The zinc metal in this case gives us a lower bound. We know the equilibrium, the surface potential is at least higher than that, and we know it's at least lower than some upper bound given by the hydrogen equ equilibrium potential. So we consider as many different surface potentials as we like between those values. And for each surface potential, uh, we can evaluate the current density for each process using the butler volmer equation. And we're looking simply for when we have charge balance between the anodes and cathodes. We're simply going to look by brute force to see at what surface potential this, re uh, this system will be in a steady rate. So if we do that, uh, we get a beautiful graph that looks like this. We have uh, surface potential in volts SHE on the x-axis and current density on the y-axis. In fact, this y-axis has current to the power of one ninth, just in order to stretch the scales and make everything visible, which we want to see. In this graph, we have four different processes. The current density for each one is plotted using the butler volmer equation, so it's a, a fairly accurate model of the corrosion current density even near the equilibriums. And we have these four total anodic and cathodic currents added together to give the total current the blue line. So we're just looking for a solution where there is charge balance, so where the blue line corresponds to zero net current. And we can find that surface potential, and given the surface potential, we can then read off the actual current density for each of the four processes happening on this block of metal. So that's a, a more exact but computationally expensive method of studying corrosion on complicated systems with multiple, multiple electrodes. Uh, it's probably not what you'd do in an exam, not if somebody wanted to ask a reasonably short bit of algebra, but it's what you could certainly do in the 21st century. While I'm on the subject of the 21st century, uh, let me say bimetallic corrosion is not a new phenomenon. It's not a shocking new thing that we only learned about in the last few decades. Actually, it's one of the oldest corrosion phenomena you can read if you look up the historical background literature. You can find a beautifully written letter to the Admiralty of the Royal Navy, written in the 18th century describing bimetallic corrosion uh, when they started to first do experimental work building advanced new sailing ships which had copper plating attached to the hull. So the copper plating was there for a good reason, to prevent sea creatures from attacking the wood and to prevent biofouling. And they discovered something they actually could explain fairly well at the time that the steel or iron nails used to attach the copper plating are corroded really badly and that's because of bimetallic corrosion. So it's been known for a very long time that you have to avoid this problem. That doesn't stop people continuing to cause this problem today. Uh, you can still find examples of badly chosen two metal systems like for example expensive and effective magnesium alloy aircraft components being attached using stainless steel bearing systems uh, or you can find heat exchanges where people have decided they're going to use nice copper pipes because they have excellent thermal characteristics and they're going to encase this in a carbon steel shell which is strong and cheap and of course doomed them to suffer by metallic corrosion because of how they've built it. Uh, how then uh, can we deal with bimetallic corrosion? Apart from this one way of making sure that we only use one metal, well, we can get around it a few different ways. We can have two different metals, but we can separate them by some plastic or other electrically insulating uh, connector material, uh, like some sort of rubber gasket between two different metals, pipe metals. Or we could say, I'm going to use two different metals, but I'm going to use two very similar methods so that the, the strength of this bimetallic phenomenon is going to be less significant and it's not going to be so destructive for the more reactive metal. In the worst case, I guess I could also just allow for some loss of the reactive metal. Or 
that's not generally preferable, but you could make it so that if I'm going to have a large metal sheet attached using some uh, nails or screws, I could try and make it so that the nails or screws are actually the more noble part, or slightly more noble, and this is frequently done with connecting stainless steel. So large quantities of 304 stainless steel sheet are slightly more reactive than the commonly chosen 316 stainless steel screws or bolts used to attach it to things. This means that bimetallic corrosion actually does you a slight amount of service because it protects the potentially delicate bolts and it does so at a cost of maybe causing more corrosion over the uh, extensive large surface area of the 304 stainless steel and because it's a large surface area it can tolerate the bimetallic loss. So we can do some things to try and get around bimetallic corrosion but we shouldn't think that we've been too clever. We might end up thinking that we've been very clever and actually we're going to discover that we haven't avoided bimetallic corrosion at all. And this problem uh, can happen if we have something called deposition corrosion. Deposition corrosion happens when Often you have something like a recirculated water system and it has one section which is say copper pipe and another section which is say aluminium pipe. Copper and aluminium are a particularly classic pair of metals for deposition corrosion to affect. And what happens is that you have the system designed and you separate, you have electrical insulating connections between the copper and aluminium by design and this leaves you thinking that you won't have bimetallic corrosion. But in fact you can do, because remember the copper, although it's basically going to be immune from corrosion in deaerated water, it will dissolve to a very small concentration of dissolved copper 2 plus ions. So your copper will dissolve a small amount into the recirculated water, and when those copper ions find themselves passing over the aluminium pipe, they will very happily do a displacement reaction and your copper ions will plate onto the aluminium metal, giving you the perfect situation for bimetallic corrosion to start affecting the aluminium. Uh, what, a, what, um, what can we do to avoid this? So, apart from being very careful about incompatible metals in recirculated water systems, where this is very likely to happen because of the time available for copper ions, say, to build up inside the water, uh, we might avoid this actually, we might get lucky and we might be in a, a place where we have lime scale, and hard water which produces lime scale can put a mass transport barrier, just a, a thick, fairly inert layer, onto the surface of, say, the aluminium. And in that case, there's no way that your copper ions can deposit from solution onto the aluminium, and they can't cause the deposition corrosion problem. So we might get lucky, or we might even be very clever and deliberately chemically make hard water if we have a two-metal system uh, so that we might then not have the deposition corrosion problem. Okay, so bimetallic corrosion is the more technical of the localized corrosion phenomena we've looked at. We need to be able to analyze it, potentially still using algebra or Evans diagrams to look at speed of corrosion. And now we're going to move on to some phenomena which we can look at a bit more descriptively. Section 4.4 is on crevice corrosion. This is an intense localized corrosion phenomena which can occur in areas that have restricted liquid access. We also call these areas occluded areas, difficult to get to bits in other words. Uh, this is especially severe, the crevice corrosion, when chloride ions are present, which can be either from seawater or from road salt getting into the local water. Okay, what does crevice corrosion look like? It looks like this picture. So uh, this is part of a bridge. We have some steel components bolted to some other steel components and somewhere there was a crack in between one of them or some water got in and this caused this crevice corrosion phenomena. So that you can see in this area that there's a lot of rust has happened and it's resulted in the steel peeling away uh, from where it should be. And meanwhile on the rest of this structure there isn't any noticeable corrosion, really, not on the same sort of level. Okay, the rest of it's painted, so maybe that's why there isn't any corrosion anywhere else. But uh, even if 
the rest of the structure had been open to the environment. Crevice corrosion taking place in this area of restricted liquid access uh, would have been much worse than uniform corrosion happening on the rest of the surface. Uh, that's because there's a particular mechanism going on here. Uh, the mechanism for crevice corrosion uh, looks something like this. We start off with the idea that we have a part of the metal which is difficult to get to. And we start off, we have corrosion of the metal, say it's reacting with dissolved oxygen uniformly over the whole surface, including in the difficult to get to crevice. But because of this restricted access, soon the local dissolved oxygen within the crevice is depleted. And then we have this situation that we have metal reacting with oxygen across the bulk surface of the metal. And on the bulk surface there's probably also some metal dissolution. But within the crevice we only have metal dissolution. There's no oxygen reaction. Uh, that's important because if there was an oxygen reaction it might absorb positive charge from solution. You might have oxygen molecules plus some protons reacting plus taking in some electrons and that would be a cathode reaction. Uh, but that stops happening inside the crevice and you only have production of say metal 2 plus positive ions in solution and you don't have consumption of positive hydrogen ions from solution. So this results in the crevice containing in solution unbalanced charge. Well, it does for a bit, but this soon balances itself out because the positive ions within the crevice attract negative ions from elsewhere in the electrolyte. Commonly, it draws in chloride ions, which are negatively charged and quite mobile. So as a result of that, you end up with a crevice where you have metal dissolving, but in the presence of a high chloride concentration, which is one thing which promotes the further destruction of the metal. And that's not all. You also have the possibility for the positive metal ions building up inside the crevice to undergo some acid-base chemistry and solution. They react with water and they give you uh, maybe metal solid hydroxide, just a powder which precipitates from solution, plus you get buildup of protons in replacing the positive metal ions inside the crevice. And these protons, of course, cause acidification, the pH goes down. So this means that your crevice corrosion problem, once it starts happening, is autocatalytic because its own chemistry produces results, acidification and chloride, which both cause the active corrosion phenomena to become much more severe. So once this crevice corrosion happens, it's not easy, it's not trivially easy to deal with it. Ideally, then, if we want to avoid crevice corrosion being a problem, we should use robust design. We should maybe avoid having situations where there are these cracks which water can pool in, especially if it's salt water. Uh, we should probably make sure that we have good paints, both as a barrier to water and maybe zinc-containing paints, which act the zinc metal in the paint as a sacrificial anode to prevent the start of the crevice corrosion, because if the uh, zinc dissolves, then it's going to prevent the opening up of a, of a further crevice caused by loss of metal from the structural steel, for example. On the other hand, if this crevice corrosion does happen, uh, then we have to be quite aggressive about treating it. So it's not good enough to simply paint over it because the crevice will remain under the paint and you'll have continuing corrosion. Instead, it would have to be cleaned thoroughly, probably sandblasted to remove all of the rust because, of course, the rust is probably full of chloride and is probably an acidified environment. And then this cleaned area would then have to be thoroughly protected, probably by a good zinc containing paint to hopefully stop the process starting again after it's been cleaned off. Okay, good. Section 4.5. Pitting corrosion. One of the most common sights on old metals is this pitted texture. And not only is it quite a common sight, but for a corrosion engineer, it's one of the most worrying. Let me describe this texture. If we saw a block of wood with this appearance, we would say it looked like it had been eaten by worms. 
Of course, with metal we expect no such thing, but we could describe the pitting as it giving the impression that the metal has been eaten by acid or chloride solution. Of course, we can immediately see why this is worrying. The deep individual pits could easily puncture through the metal, leading to some sort of chemical leak in a pressure vessel or a pipeline, or leading to a deep crack which could cause failure of a structural metal. Now, pitting corrosion, once it gets going and reaches these deep pits, the mechanism proceeds a lot like crevice corrosion. But the beginning of pitting corrosion is very different to crevice corrosion, and is in fact part of the reason why the pitting process is so worrying for corrosion engineers. Because the fact is, these pits are forming not on, as could be predicted for crevice corrosion, they're not forming in difficult-to-reach occluded areas, they frequently form on flat metal surface, which we would expect would be quite resistant to crevice corrosion. And it's worse than that. The pitting corrosion is frequently a problem when it occurs on metals which we actually think should be passive against corrosion. I'm thinking of metals like stainless steels or maybe aluminium alloys, which should have a nice passive surface layer. In fact, they've probably been chosen to be passive in their environment. But for various possible reasons, they in fact, in local spots, begin to corrode actively. And once the pit begins to be established, then the active corrosion, as I said, can lead to the metal being punctured or cracked to a point where brittle failure becomes likely. So, how does this pitting corrosion get started, and what can we do to stop it? Well, the pitting corrosion, we can think of this taking place on, say, a passive stainless steel. Now, it should be the case that the surface of this metal has a nice passive oxide film, which should just sit there in solution. However, we can have something called the nucleation of a pit. This can happen if a tiny scratch breaks the surface passive oxide physically. Or there could be a flaw in the metal's microstructure so that a tiny spot was vulnerable to dissolution even though the bulk alloy was in general passive. Or, again, there might be a properly made, uniformly passive alloy, but there might be a corrosive microenvironment. Maybe a drying spot of hydrochloric acid on the surface becomes smaller and smaller as it dries, and as it becomes smaller, its concentration becomes higher and higher, until the acid is so strong that it causes the passive oxide film to dissolve in the small environment under the drying spot of acid. And at that point, you have a small region of localised active corrosion beneath a metal film where most of the surface is simply passive. And this small region of active corrosion leads to the pit, the formation which then goes on to look a lot like crevice corrosion. Now, the reason it looks like crevice corrosion is because, remember, the bulk metal probably does have a passive film, a passive surface oxide, and this forms effectively a ceiling over the growing corrosion pit. And the ceiling keeps the pit well isolated from the bulk electrolyte, and so it allows this problem of oxygen depletion and acidification and chloride buildup to take place within the pit. And then your metal can suffer bad active corrosion, even though it's only really, it only really started to suffer this in a small place, and the bulk surface remains passive, nonetheless the material itself is compromised. Okay, so that's the mechanism for the pitting onset, and then you have pit growth, and unless you're fortunate enough to have pit termination, uh, then you potentially have a quite serious and ongoing problem that can lead to failure of your metal object. How then do we avoid pitting from happening? Well, pitting occurs on metals which are only just passive. So the point is that the corrosive microenvironment, or the moderately weak surface defect, 
causes this active corrosion to begin. This really happens when the actual environment the metal object is in is close to the border between passive resistance to corrosion and active dissolution. So one way we can avoid pitting corrosion is in design to choose a much more passive alloy. In the case of stainless steels, that means simply switching in the brochure from an average stainless steel to one with maybe a higher chromium or nickel content. Uh, there is a pretty large range of progressively more passive alloys available, and you can read more about the exact alloy choices in textbooks. The simple story is that higher chromium or higher nickel stainless steel alloys tend to be broadly more passive against corrosion. But you can also imagine switching to uh, profoundly more passive metals like titanium or titanium alloys, if necessary. A titanium in particular has the virtue of its oxide being much more resistant to chloride attack than many of the stainless steels. Uh, in general then, pitting corrosion is something that you want to avoid by choosing a suitable alloy to resist it. If that's not possible, it's worth asking the question, is it possible to make the environment less aggressive? It's often the case that strongly acid or high temperature or high chloride solutions are the cause of pitting. So maybe if those kinds of environments actually turn out not to be necessary and you can avoid them by environment modification, that can be a way to protect uh, metals which actually were not able to stand up with them and started to show signs of pitting. And we really do generally want to avoid pitting corrosion because it is a classic phenomenon for causing leaks of toxic or expensive chemicals which we really didn't want to be able to escape from something. And it's also a classic phenomenon for causing structural failures through crack growth. Okay, section 4.6 is on intergranular corrosion and weld decay. Now in this section we want to continue thinking about microstructure of metals and how microstructure, if damaged by corrosion, can lead to further problems and failures. Now, uh, what do we know? Well, we need to know just some basics about the material science of metal. Uh, we need to know that, in general, metals are polycrystalline materials. When the metal is made by quenching from the liquid into a nice solid object, it contains crystallites which grow and link up and lead to grains in the final solid. This is important because it leaves grain boundaries, and these bits of the metal microstructure are often the most vulnerable to corrosion. More vulnerable than the bulk metal, uh, because the bulk metal, having the composition which you intended the metal to have, it's probably a good alloy for what you wanted it to do. It probably is passive against corrosion. Or, if it corrodes actively, it probably is slow enough that you're not going to worry about it. The grain boundaries, on the other hand, tend to contain any kind of rubbish that was rejected from the cooling crystallite as the metal was formed. Uh, this means that grain boundaries might contain straightforward voids, those are defects in the metal object which could lead to pitting corrosion, or the grain boundaries might contain impurities, and impurities might be more reactive than the bulk metal was intended to be, so that they can actively dissolve easily. Even if that's not a problem, the grain boundaries if they contain a second phase different from the main metal, uh, might lead to bimetallic corrosion. Probably not as severely as if you had a straightforward copper pipe connected to an aluminium pipe, but nonetheless two phases could allow bimetallic corrosion and the more reactive phase could start to dissolve. Now, this is another way you could have a cracks opening up in the microstructure of some metal. Overall, this means that the formation of lots of nasty grain boundaries within a metal microstructure is something you want to avoid if you want the object to have good uniform properties.
And in corrosion science, we're worried especially about ways in which the microstructure can become more vulnerable to corrosion by the formation of extra grain boundaries within the metal. Um, a pretty key method that you can have grain boundary formation is that you can do some bad heat treatment. And an important one for us to know about is weld decay. Uh, what is bad heat treatment? Actually, we can be quite precise about it. We can say that what we want for our metal is for it to be a nice, uniform, well-dispersed mixture of its different component atoms. In steel, for example, we want the small amount of carbon dissolved in the iron to be uniformly distributed so that it provides uniform strength against yielding, which is one of the things which carbon does as part of a steel alloy. In stainless steel, we want the chromium, maybe 18% uh, by mass in the alloy. We, may, we want the chromium to be uniformly well dispersed so that we have the ability for the chromium passive oxide layer to form no matter which bit of the metal is exposed to a corrosive environment. How can we have uniformly well dispersed uh, alloy components? Well, we can start with a liquid, in which case we have the molten metal and for sure everything is nicely well dispersed. We can quench it quickly and then we end up with a solid alloy where everything is well dispersed. If we quench very slowly, uh, then we can have worse problems. Uh, the fact is that well dispersed alloy, uniformly dissolved alloy components in the cold solid phase are not necessarily thermodynamically favourable. It might be favourable for lumps of different phases to form, or for solid carbide phases to form which are separate from the main metal phase and not well dispersed in it. That's something which can't happen if we quench the metal quickly because kinetically the rearrangement can't happen. But a bad heat treatment, which is potentially very unfavourable for steel properties and for stainless steel properties, is to heat the metal up to about 600 to 1000 Celsius and to have it there for a few minutes. In that case, it's cold enough that it's thermodynamically favourable for phase separation to happen but it's hot enough uh, that it can happen kinetically fairly quickly, which wouldn't happen at room temperature. So we want to avoid, in particular, a heat treatment of 600 to 1000, or maybe between 600 and 850 Celsius, some people say. We want to avoid having that sort of temperature present on a metal for any long period of time. We certainly don't want to have it there for minutes. Okay. And this is why one of the worst heat treatments you can do to a piece of metal is that you can weld it. Of course, there's reasons why we want to weld steel. It's usually to join bits together. So we have often no choice but to do it, but then we need to do it properly. We don't want to uh, have a bad treatment. And let me describe a bad treatment to you. You have this diagram. So this diagram shows that we've welded a couple of bits of metal together. Uh, the bit where the semi-molten metals have merged actually isn't the worst part of the problem. Uh, in that region, you have metal that's been heated up to, say, 1500 Celsius, very hot, so that it's semi-molten, and then it's been allowed to cool pretty quickly after you stop welding it. So this bit probably has fairly well dispersed alloy components. The real problem happens somewhere slightly distant from the welding, and you have this vulnerable heat sensitized zone. So in this region you have had the bad heat treatment of 600 to 1000 Celsius for a few minutes, and you have the ability for phase separation to occur and for lots of grain boundaries to form. The grain boundaries themselves are a source of vulnerability in the metal, and on top of that, um, in both carbon steels and stainless steels, there are some additional problems that happen. In carbon steel, the big problem that happens is carbide precipitation. So it turns out um, iron carbides like this uh, Fe3C, uh, these are quite thermodynamically stable. So compared to the well-dispersed dissolved carbon which you'd like to have throughout your alloy, 
during the heat treatment you have thermodynamic driving force for the uh, the carbide the pure carbide to form and these crystals the problem with this is that by crystallizing pure carbide in your alloy you've depleted the dispersed carbon that you wanted to have in your steel now, this results in a steel with a worse yield stress in addition to the corrosion vulnerable grain boundaries formed around the crystallites of carbide stainless steel has a slightly different problem the problem is that chromium carbide is formed even more favorably than iron carbide so in a stainless steel with small amounts of dispersed carbon for a yield strength improvement as well as say 18 weight percent chromium for corrosion resistance if the material is heat sensitized you actually have the precipitation of chromium carbides this depletes the chromium in the bulk stainless steel and means that it no longer has the critical amount of chromium required for the material to passivate correctly this means that heat sensitized stainless steel can be just horribly vulnerable to corrosion Luckily, we can do a few things about that. Um, you can choose, basically, a different choice of alloy. Lots of stainless steels, like, for example, a 316L alloy, are designed so that they have low carbon. Uh, the L means low carbon in that particular alloy name. Uh, low carbon stainless steels obviously have a much less ability to, to precipitate chromium carbides, and thus less vulnerability to chromium depletion on heat treatment. Alternatively, you can have something called a stabilized stainless steel alloy. So at somewhat more cost, you can have your alloy contain some titanium or niobium. Those happen to be even stronger carbon getters than chromium. So under welding, the alloy precipitates titanium carbide, say. Uh, that's not ideal because it adds some grain boundaries, but at least it doesn't deplete the chromium from the bulk alloy. And the bulk alloy remains resistant to corrosion because it's still able to passivate okay as an alternative to better alloy choices uh, you can simply pay someone better and more skilled to do your welding quickly so that you don't have heat sensitization because of prolonged high-ish temperatures alternatively if that's not possible and you have an object that's small enough for you to anneal it, then after you've finished welding, uh, you can give it a very high temperature treatment, not quite to melt it, but maybe up to somewhere over a thousand Celsius to redissolve all of the precipitated carbides, and then quickly quench the uh, quickly quench the object after this annealing treatment, and then you have uh, you've restored the intended uniform microstructure of the alloy. So those are things which are done uh, to avoid problems caused by welding. They're particularly important in the oil and gas industry when you don't want uh, things to be breaking at a join. So welding needs to be done well whenever you need a, a high performance component. Okay, section 4.7 is on the last localized corrosion phenomena which I want to start looking at in this lecture. This is flow induced corrosion and we're starting to look here at phenomena which happen when we combine chemical deterioration of corrosion with mechanical abuse in service or I say abuse uh, just the fact that the material has a difficult mechanical job to perform. Flow induced corrosion is what we have when there is an issue that motion of some fluid over a metal surface speeds up corrosion. This happens because of a combination of factors. So maybe we have a flow of fluid which contains entrained particles or fines, things like sand. Now these particles scour away any protective passive oxides which might form on the metal. In the case of metals that have a soft passive surface, like copper, this mechanical damage leads to re-exposure of the raw metal, so that instead of having actual passivity, the metal simply corrodes, continues to actively corrode faster than it would have if it had been allowed to passivate nicely. As an alternative to mechanical damage by particles, we could have cavitation. So fast fluid flows might result in the formation of uh, cavities, or essentially bubbles, caused by pressure shifts in the flow. Uh, 
So these bubbles can form and collapse with quite strong shock waves, and this can damage metal or damage passive oxide surfaces. This kind of damage is probably the thing which has affected the pipe, this copper pipe, uh, which has a 90-degree uh, bend, and it's been sawed through. And you can see on the inside there's lots of shiny and actually damaged metal surface. Copper is quite soft, so it's easily damaged. And on some parts of the pipe you can see there's this green corrosion product. Now, in a slow flow, it may be that this pipe would have reacted with the... Clearly it's reacted with the fluid inside the pipe and it's produced this green oxide. This might actually be providing a degree of passivity because it is a solid oxide and it might be allowing the pipe to sit there and resist further corrosion. However, in this system, because the fluid flow is reasonably fast, and this problem is probably made worse by the fact this is at a 90 degree bend, resulting in a pressure head, then this uh, passive oxide has been scoured away by the fluid flow, uh, causing active corrosion to take place of this copper pipe. So this is, uh, system probably shows, this picture probably shows mechanical damage or erosion corrosion, uh, part of the way that flow-induced corrosion can happen. As a third thing involved in fluid flows, it may be the fluid contains dissolved oxygen, and a faster fluid flow is quite likely to supply oxygen to the metal surface at a faster rate. And if we have a system which is vulnerable to oxidation by dissolved oxygen, then faster mass transport of the dissolved oxygen uh, may often be a source of further corrosion. And all of these can happen as a combination of factors. So we have here a graph showing in section 4.7.1 erosion corrosion. This erosion corrosion graph is relevant for mechanical damage being the main problem in the flow-induced corrosion. So we're thinking of something like the copper pipe, which might form a passive surface that would protect it from corrosion under some situations, but this passive surface is being damaged. The damage caused by erosion corrosion is effectively causing a higher and higher passive corrosion rate uh, in this system. Okay, so corrosion rate as a, as a function of flow velocity has three regimes when we're looking at erosion corrosion. So we have a slow flow velocity, low Reynolds number, then we have laminar flow. This means that we have creeping flow of the liquid which moves very slowly over the metal surface. That means any entrained particles are not going to cause much abrasion to the passive oxide surface. And we have not very large amount of oxide removal and even with increasing velocities below a certain level this doesn't cause very much more passive corrosion. There's a transition regime. This is for mid-Reynolds numbers. This is when turbulent flow starts to happen. At this point the flow near the metal surface is not necessarily slow. It could be swirling around and in that case we do have the ability for quite a lot of abrasion to happen. So in this regime you have with increasing flow velocity, the er 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 erosion corrosion becomes rapidly worse. And this happens until we reach basically a plateau of the corrosion rate. In fast flow velocities, the abrasion is happening basically at the maximum rate it can. And here, the corrosion rate, uh, we'd expect the material maybe to be passive from thermodynamics, but in fact the relatively soft passive oxide is being removed by abrasion pretty much as quickly as it forms. In this case we've reached a plateau rate which is actually more or less the the rate of reaction of the bare metal to form what should be nice solid oxide producing passivity but actually it's all being removed. So we have those three regimes for erosion corrosion. Slow laminar flow which is not so bad, a mid-turbulent regime which causes erosion corrosion to rapidly increase with flow velocity, and then a plateau where we've got basically the most erosion that we can imagine happening. Okay, in section 4.7.2 uh, we just have a comment that when 
we have not just erosion, but the flow-induced corrosion also uh, involves problem caused by increased oxygen transport in the faster flow, uh, then we potentially have a slightly more complex situation. So this is something which is looked at in one of the example sheet questions in the second example sheet. It's a bit more complicated than erosion alone, uh, but something you can read about. Anyway, in section 4.7.3, how do we protect against flow-induced corrosion? So we can actually do quite a lot in terms of engineering, because flows are something that we're looking at in hydraulic engineering, and hydraulics we have quite a lot available to us. Uh, one thing we have available is filters. We can try to remove particles or abrasive fines uh, before they cause any scouring action that we might regret later. We can also do good hydraulic designs. We can avoid putting sharp bends into pipes. Those are the bends which might create areas of fast flow or pressure drops which could cause erosion or cavitation. Another thing that we can do is we can try to make sure that the metal surfaces that we're using to handle fluids, uh, these are smooth and they therefore have fewer sites where bubble nucleation or cavitation might happen in a fast flow. If it can't happen, then it can't cause damage. Finally, we should note that erosion corrosion, it's often a problem for metals that have a soft passive oxide, like copper. If we think about a hard metal instead, like stainless steels, these have much stronger passive and in fact thinner passive surface oxides, and these are naturally much more resistant to damage by erosion or by cavitation. They're just mechanically strong enough to stand up to it. Okay. So we've looked in 4.7 at a combination of corrosion with mechanical effects, and we'll look at a few more of these next time uh, with stress corrosion cracking. That's something that we shall look at in the future. Good.